I've sheltered and slept beneath many different types of tents. Standard geodesic ones, tunnel ones, polycotton teepee style ones, giant single skin base camp ones, little sheepy ones. Most have something to recommend them, and each has a role to play in a certain context. What's become very clear is that in my chosen environment, that is, cold places, one tent design rarely suits all trips. Some are suited for deep snow, others barely any snow at all on rock, ice or earth. Some have endless wind, others barely any. Some need space within them to work, others just somewhere to sleep. And I've been working on what I guess you could call an expedition problem, self-funded, working on the Alaskan North Slope over the last couple of years, whilst I take a little bit of time to reorganise my big ticket expedition project. And this place is windy, exposed, but with only a thin layer of snow. Building protective snow walls for a tent is very hard there, even in winter time. So I've returned to the factory team at Alpkit, an outdoor clothing and equipment company based near Nottingham, England, because I want to invent something I plan to call a tent. Broadly, you could describe it as a lightweight outdoor shelter for travellers. Now, channel watchers of average and above loyalty will recall a film I made with the team there last year when my Alaska teammate James and I needed custom-made nylon covers for our snow sledges. They were excellent. So, I'm back to ask for more technical assistance. There will be two differences this time round. No sledge covers, as making the same film twice would be strange, and this time Alpkit have waived some of their fees because they enjoyed the film that I made last time. It is important I'm upfront about that, but there's a reason why I've spent many hundreds of my hard-earned pounds with them over the years. They're pretty damn good. Right, onward. I'll confess that I've misled you regarding my inventing the tent. I've done many things and this is not amongst them but I've slept in many of them, over many months, in some very angry places. There will never be a perfect tent for all circumstances, but I did have an idea for a niche sort of shelter. Expanding on my introduction, for a place with this combination. Some snow, but no rain, so no need for Senecalized waterproof fly sheets. Enough snow to shovel around, but not enough to dig down into or make solid blocks from. Regular windy days, sometimes very windy, and finally, people inside who don't want tenting the fly sheets flapping in their face all night long. Now I'm not a talented snow house or igloo builder, but I've long since thought that using snow, which can be phenomenally strong, to our advantage has to be the way forward. Most winter tenting people are used to using protective walls made of snow, but they take ages to build, don't adapt to wind direction change, and they need reasonably compacted snow if they aren't going to fall into pieces. So I came up with an idea, sketched it, and shared the fruits with the poor, unsuspecting staff of Alpkit's custom and tent team. They were a combination of amused and terrified, but this is clearly a confirmation that I'm onto something. I didn't think it was a mad idea. I thought there was potential in it, and I could see where your logic came from. You'll recognise Gemma from the last video on the right, Emma, the factory boss on my right, and finally designer and tent magician Rowan. You can work out which one he is and they set off to think about how their half of the design was going to be put together. Alpkit were going to take care of the fabric half, and I would take care of the rigid part of the structure. Think of this harmonious combination of materials in the same manner you would the iconic design like a rib, rigid inflatable boat, except that my shelter won't get wet, nor will it inflate. Instead, we made a fort constructed of foam. This is because I was thoroughly behind the scheduled manufacturing of eight sets of lightweight composite boards, and we needed to measure and get the sense of how the first prototype would fit. You'll slowly get a sense of the Hibbert box, as Alpkit christened it, but basically I'm going for a low rigid wall that sits on or just below the snow surface and is braced and secured with loose piled snow around the perimeter without the need for a separate snow wall. The benefits are many, but the first will be being able to really utilize the edges of the tent interior as the curved fly sheet won't be in the way. Inside, you can see that despite having a footprint barely larger than a three-person dome tent with vestibule, and indeed shorter than one, it's cavernous. You could sleep ten inside if you were going to go by the comically unrealistic capacity ratings most tent manufacturers claim. The top over the top will tension onto the box structure, but also have two vertical poles to help maintain shape and a modest wind-friendly height. 
I did consider an adaptable design so you could either hunker down with a near flush tarp on top of the box, or a huge tall design for calmer evenings and allowing for standing room, but perhaps for another time. There's going to be a gap at the narrow end of the tapered footprint, where a three-sided zip door can allow us ingress and egress and avoid permanent incarceration. We measured various distances and angles needed for the second prototype, as Rowan needed to iron out fundamental shape changes and how we'd space out the tensioning straps, and Gemma wanted to ensure the second prototype could be used to make a template from. In my absence, they continued the righteous mockery of the Hibbert box, but concurrently went through the design, methodically solving areas of concern and making decisions about seams, zips and eyelets. The second prototype used a fabric weight nearly identical to that that I'd imported from the main build. I wanted a hyper-strong nylon weave made by an American brand. Also, Gemma had come across a hem problem, but naturally had solved it whilst concurrently strengthening the top edges. Okay. So, first style of finishing the edges, we didn't like this, but it meant all the fabrics kind of rocked up, mm. which over two metres, we were losing about 20 centimetres of length. So when we came to put it back up, we were a little bit short at the front. So we've decided to find it instead. The zips were more or less the same design as before, and I decided to wait until the end to make the two carbon fibre beams that will complete the structure of the box and keep the door itself in shape. We checked over the dimensions a few more times, altered the planned height of the structure as I felt it might have become a little bit tall and thereby vulnerable. Before long, the special fabric arrived from the US. It's a newly designed ripstop weave using high tenacity nylon, and unlike most, has no coating whatsoever. Most outdoor destined nylons have silicon, polyurethane, and or a DWR coated on or impregnated within to help repel water. I'm not intending on getting rained on, and uncoated nylon allows moisture within to escape more easily. White nylon is hard to come by as it's not great under strong UV from the sun, plus it marks easily. But we want to maximise light transmittance to make the best of dim late winter arctic light, and none of that annoying colour cast that most coloured tents give you once inside. I resume my usual role during the manufacturing phase, namely observer and general nuisance. James, my teammate, far more wisely got himself some work to do and kept himself out of mischief. Gemma again did the build for us, as she's the custom job head honcho, and can create things from various fabrics with speed and precision I can barely fathom. As well as joining the four large panels together, there was the entrance hatch zip to fix in. Using um, materials and techniques that we know already were very key, so that it creates a foolproof thing. We chose a large toothed double-sided zipper, so there's a minimal chance of a lock-in, or indeed a lock-out, or a total failure of our doorway. It's about a metre wide, and matches the height of the rigid side panels. I'll give you a little more about those panels at the end. Then the hems. I mentioned the initial problem with bunching that messed up the prototype edges. This machine is my second favourite in the factory. For years I wondered how large-scale production gets through hundreds of metres of these sorts of jobs. Now I know there's a module, an automation or a gizmo to fast-track most things. With the tarp, strictly a fly sheet, now all in one piece and in the correct shape. There are a load of strips of webbing to attach, a high friction sort to grab onto buckles securely. These will fit through slots and into buckles attached to the lower structure, allowing us to tension the tarp properly and from inside. This is starting to get towards finishing touches territory for the tarp at least. The other way we're going to tension this single tarp, which differs from many tents with an inner and an outer fly, is through two vertical poles made from carbon fibre. They'll sit on little adjustable feet which stop the poles digging down into the snow, and they also extend the poles upwards so that they can take an additional tension. The tops of the poles have spigots so they can locate into the tarp. Gemma, having gone through a few different options with Rowan the designer, settled on using eyelets over a reinforced patch of nylon in the two mid-tarp positions where the poles will reach skyward. Again, a machine especially for that, and none of the drama you can get if trying to hammer eyelets, as I've done in the past. With finishing touches taking place, and under the ever-sceptical eye of the in-house security team, the tarp was done in just a few unrushed hours. Not bad for a custom one-off. It's hard to get a sense of something like this until held properly in shape. So that's what we did. And here's roughly how the structure will sit. We'll angle the non-door end corners into the wind, so help minimise the obvious effects of high winds, but also the chances of snow circling back and blocking our doorway in something called spin drift. 
That's more or less the app kit job done, save for a little stuff sack made in double quick time. The fabric weighs in at well under a kilo. I'm not pretending that the shelter will weigh in below that of an expedition dome tent, so around 4 to 6 kilograms as a target, but this will have an inbuilt wall, no need to spend an hour building one from snow every evening. My initial design for the panels, all eight of them identical for ease of use in the field, has needed a rethink. They began as a sandwich design using composites and foam. It's common to use a foam core to increase stiffness without adding much to the weight. The main skins are a hybrid of carbon fibre, which is stiff and brittle, and Kevlar aramid fibre, which is less stiff but can handle more abrasion and impact. The core is a hyperlight polyurethane foam, and the edges are pinched back together and reinforced with more carbon fibre. But I'm doing this to them. The sandwich is too thick, and the skin's too thin, meaning that the principle of two skins fighting each other in compression and tension, so giving extra stiffness, isn't doing that. The panels were still far too flexible, yet with a penalty of being about half an inch thick. I'm going to save the foam and one side of the carbon Kevlar for the other projects, and instead add a great deal more reinforcement to the edges, with no sandwich. My hope was that I'll lose thickness, which helps storage, as well as all important weight, and get a stiffer, stronger panel. We ran out of time to get this design on the snow this winter season, but the good news is that there'll be another one. So folks, until the snow returns. Bye.